Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here and another busy week of SpaceX updates to share with you. Uh, early in the week, we witnessed the amazing Starlink launch, sending the first operational set of satellites into orbit. Then, of course, there has been plenty of Starship production news going on and even some more news about Crew Dragon. So, yes, a lot to cram into this video. So let's get stuck into it. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. After three months of zero Falcon 9 flight, SpaceX didn't disappoint this week with a brilliant mission sending the first officially operational set of Starlink satellites to orbit. And in doing so, it broke a number of records. As you can see, this was a clear morning launch, Beautiful footage here as the Falcon 9 fires its engines and lifts off from the pad from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Now, one of the most common questions I've had this week in the comment threads is around the differences between the initial set of Starlink satellites sent back in May versus the set sent this week. Those first 60 satellites from May were always considered test versions and they were really just missing a number of components that were actually needed for the full performance of the Starlink network. In that initial test launch, there was of course the deployment mechanisms for the satellites um, and they'd never been used before either. So there was a lot to test here as well. The operational satellites sent up on Monday have a few differences. As stated by SpaceX in the webcast, these satellites now include KA band antennas, where the initial test satellites did not. Another very important factor in running a massive network of this size is that they can essentially safely dispose of all of this when their mission is over, which is, as far as we know, roughly five years or so for each satellite. After the mission for a single satellite is complete, it will simply deorbit itself with the remaining fuel it has, and then it's going to burn up in the atmosphere. Now, with the massive number of satellites in the network, these are going to be re-entering all the time. Therefore, the latest set of satellites are designed to completely burn up in the atmosphere on re-entry. The test Starlink satellite sent back in May apparently had around 5% of material that would actually survive re-entry. Not a lot, but it's great to eliminate all of the material that can potentially fall from the sky and rain down on populated areas. So good news there. The launch vehicle itself actually has broken several records this week. Firstly, this is the very first mission where SpaceX reused a payload fairing. This is the huge cover that protects the fragile payload inside. After leaving the atmosphere, this splits in two, ejects off the vessel, then these fairings re-enter the atmosphere and deploy their own parafoils to glide down and uh, then touch down in the ocean, or with any luck be caught right out of the air with either one of the awesome fairing recovery ships now available. The two fairing retrieval vessels had actually departed to attempt a double catch of the fairings for this mission, but sadly both ships needed to abort the attempt due to the poor conditions at the time. Now this particular fairing was actually from the Arabsat 6A Falcon Heavy mission from April this year. This isn't just a record for SpaceX either. As far as we know, this is the first fairing ever reused on an orbital class mission. The next record for SpaceX was the huge mass incorporated into the Starlink satellites themselves. This launch was the heaviest mission SpaceX has ever launched. Each satellite has a mass of around 260 kilograms. Multiply that by the 60 and the total mass is around 15,600 kilograms for the satellites plus the payload and attachments which adds more on top of that. Now that is a huge amount and quite a lot heavier than the previous record which was set last Starlink mission back in May. Another record? Well, this was the very first booster to fly for a fourth time. This stage in particular had already completed three other missions, landing on a drone ship twice before, and also returning to land on the west coast once at landing zone four. At the time, that landing was SpaceX's first at landing zone four, so this booster has already previously broken that record as well. You can see from the vessel here on the launch pad before takeoff that the core here is looking quite beat up. I had a number of people asking why the Falcon 9 here looked like it wouldn't even leave the launch pad or looked like garbage. But this is the thing though, and something that I hope people realize about vessels such as this reused booster, or even the developing Mark 1 Starship. 
it doesn't need to be pretty to do its job. When it comes down to it, as long as the vessel is engineered with reusability in mind, these vessels are going to continue to break records no matter how they look. So after separation of the second stage, the Falcon 9 booster flipped around, coasted to its entry burn and then screamed in through the atmosphere to touch down successfully on the drone ship, of course I still love you. And this was essentially after travelling 620 kilometres in under eight and a half minutes. Even after launching the heaviest payload to date, another successful landing. This booster must have been running on fumes as well on touchdown because as far as I'm aware, this is getting very close to the theoretical payload limit of the Falcon 9 while still landing the core like this. Now just a bit of a shout out here to Kerbal Space Academy who managed to capture the Starlink train passing overhead. Um, awesome footage, highly recommend going and checking out the full video, it's quite funny to listen to. Uh, link is here in the top right. Since then, of course, the drone ship has had a bit of a rough time getting back with rough seas. It's been a little nail-biting waiting to see if the booster gets back okay. But it did get back safely Friday morning, which is wonderful news, so the fourth flown, the fourth landed rocket booster. So yes, what an amazing time to be alive to watch these missions. Saying that, the media attention for the Falcon 9 flight didn't seem quite so large for this flight to me, which I think it's quite interesting considering how many boundaries were pushed here. There seemed to be plenty of attention the other week when we all learned of the proposed 30,000 Starlink satellites to potentially be added to the 12,000 satellites already approved. Yeah, if you haven't caught up on that news yet, by the way, please do check out my video on that from the other week. And while you're here, of course, please do consider subscribing because there is a huge amount to cover over the next few months and I'd love to share it all with you. So there seems to be a massive amount of excitement over the Starship projects, but it almost seems now like the Falcon 9 flights are becoming a little more routine and from a public point of view, perhaps even a little mundane. I still get super excited to watch every launch, but I guess people are already so used to seeing booster landings touch down like this that it's really nothing overly special these days. It's good to keep in mind, I think, that just a few years ago, landing an orbital class booster like this was unheard of, and this is still super exciting stuff. What do you think though? Are you still excited to watch the Falcon 9 launches or is this becoming a little routine to you as well? Let me know what you think in the comments. The Mark 1 Starship has been coming back together quickly this week. A lot of progress with the lower sections of the ship here, which is currently sitting down at the launch site. We can see here the raceway covers being rapidly attached early in the week and then later the two larger fins have been reattached to the lower section. Along with this though, the site itself has been having a huge overhaul. This launch site itself has in previous months looked quite cobbled together, especially back when the Starhopper was doing its test hops. But the entire launch site now is looking almost completely different. There has been some serious work going on here with the new landing pad. Loads of concrete work has been done and this footage from Boca Chica Gal on nasaspaceflight.com gives us some quite comical sped up footage of the workers cruising around smoothing out the concrete for the landing pad. We can also see the crew here dismantling a lot of these older structures as well. We should I think be fairly shortly getting some more information on the next step, that being the upcoming pressure tests. The nose segment hasn't seen a real lot of activity on the outside as far as I can see. The inside certainly seems to have had a lot of work going on though. Some interesting new weld patterns appearing here earlier in the week. I imagine there are a number of new structures added in these areas to support the fins at the top of the vessel among other support structures for the equipment mounted right up in the nose of the section. Now there's a lot of comments lately quite negative about the Mark 1 Starship because of how steampunk it all looks. A lot of people here think the vessel is just crazy, but here's the thing. The vehicle is a test vehicle, and as far as we've heard so far, the mission for the Starship is to do a low altitude flight around 20 kilometers in altitude to test out control and landing systems. What SpaceX are doing here is testing out new groundbreaking methods of reusing this next gigantic vehicle. Every groundbreaking new idea has seemed crazy until someone does it. Is the Starship 100% guaranteed to succeed? Of course not. Could it fail? Probably. It's a test vehicle 
rapidly made for testing, failure is just part of the rapid development process. Regardless of the appearance, you have to respect the amount of effort going into this. And in the end, there is only one thing that matters here. Will it complete its mission? If not, how close to completing the mission will this prototype be? How much will need re-engineering with the next Starship already partially built here in Florida? We've heard time and time again how SpaceX will fail. It was impossible to have nine engines firing together at the same time. It was certainly impossible to have 27 engines firing together as we witnessed with the Falcon Heavy twice now. Impossible to land a booster, impossible to reuse the fairings. We hear this every year, every month. In the end, it's results that matter and SpaceX have quite literally turned the entire industry on its head over the past decade and it's not going to stop now. The next 12 months are going to be super exciting as we all watch this develop. I think in particular it is going to be interesting to see what happens with a Mark 1 Starship if the 20 kilometer flight is completely successful. By that I mean that the vessel comes back to land without any significant damage. Will SpaceX be likely to refly it again with more tests or do you think that SpaceX will already be moving on to the next test vehicle? Let me know Know what you think about that in the comments. Now SpaceX this week have also announced that the full duration static fire test of Crew Dragon's launch escape system has now been completed. The team at SpaceX and NASA are combing through all of the test data and they're going to be working towards the in-flight abort demonstration mission preparation. We should be seeing some proposed launch dates appearing for that very soon so keep an eye out for that. And finally today just a quick mention of the video that dropped this week by Lex Friedman with his interview with Elon Musk. I've got a link to that in the description but just a little spoiler here there's a great Elon Musk rendition of Carl Sagan's pale blue dot in there. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do take a second and hit that like button. A huge thank you as well to my quality control squad listed here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of this, follow my Discord or Twitter link in the description and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video last week covering all of the amazing Starship developments continuously going on. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right a video that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.